you. Hi. Um, that's my Twitter handle. If you have any questions during the talk, or if you want to message me, or if you want to complain about the content, you can do so on there. So I want to start with a story. And just for the second, imagine this is a classroom. Um, in high school, I took a class that is really hard to translate it into English, but it's something a line of music appreciation or sound listening. And, you know, not only we listen to a lot of music and learn about classical music history, we also watch a lot of movies. We uh, alter the sound wave artificially to sound the conversation more softer or more sharp and think about if that changed how we thought the conversation were going. Um, we also discussed about iconography of um, the jacket cover on the record and everything. So this was the first time I realized that there is a certain such a thing as nonverbal communications. The communication that your eyes or your ears are just getting some kind of signal from light or the air will wave on the air. And somehow we are just analyzing it without even thinking and doing certain kind of a communication. And this was really fascinating to me. So I studied communication in college and also a visual anthropology. And my first job out of college was at a online video sharing community site. And now I work as a web developer making text editors. But making applications or websites or designing a system to me, it was always creating a means of communication for humans. Uh, to me, it was never about connecting two computers or two programs together. So, current day, we are surrounded by non-verbal or visual communications or sound communication, really. Uh, how many of you have, like, all of these applications in your pocket. Like, there's so many applications that use sound elements, so many applications that use picture element. Um, we are all surrounded by it. And even as a programmer, this is a really exciting time that a lot of research on image processing and computer vision is happening. This is an example of doing a style transfer which is a way to use machine learning to analyze the picture and apply the style and techniques of painting into another picture. Um, you might also know the deep dream from the Google Lab. Um, so even in the research field, really exciting thing is happening. So Discovering this type of communication was really fascinating to me because as a human eyes, whoa, this is really big picture. <laughs> like us looking at this picture, how many green circles are in this picture? One. How many yellow squares are in this picture? One. Yeah, this is interactive one, so like you can just tell me. So like we last programmer thinks that like, you know, really like to write a logic and like really like flex the logical thinking muscles. But when you're looking at it, and then like when I ask you like how many yellow squares are there, you don't need to think about like if else statement. You just like, there's one. Like you don't even think. Or you don't even know that you are thinking in your brain. And this is really in interesting and frustrating when you are trying to make an application that deals with visual element. So I want to show you one sample that I made last year. I made a application that's called Sweaterify. Um, I, um, I work as a software engineer on my day job, but on my side, uh, on my side project, I really like to create a tools and um, program to design a textile. And this was around Christmas time, so I wanted to, to make something fun, something people can just do. Um, so I made ugly sweater generator, or in British term, I guess, Christmas jumper uh, generator. You can just upload the picture, and then I will make it into a sweater form. To me, this is not even perfect, because I see this uh, image, and in my mind, there is like a vivid image of like me should be um, extracted more. There is clear uh, border between, oops, clear border between uh, here in the background and my hair, but 
when I do apl uh, apply it to the text design, um, there is no border here. And like, how do I even tell my program where is me and where is my background? And got me really interested in this topic of image processing and computer vision. When you Google computer visions, you would probably find some kind of libraries. A popular one is OpenCV. And there's like a whole bunch of documents about how to use it. So many backs, so many blog posts about how a tutorial of using this library. My main frustration was that all of them were about how to talk to this API, how to use this tool that's doing something that I don't understand. And none of them explained what actually this library is doing. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned, there's things like very trendy topic in research, like deep, deep learning and um, deep uh, dream, that you almost start feeling like, is this like something that le like belongs to research facility? Is this like really over top of my head and I can't really understand? Like, I don't know. So when we were looking at object from human eye, we can immediately identify certain um, attributes like colors of the object, height of the object, name of the object that's commonly known in the society. But the problem with computer vision is they don't look at that object. They look at digital representation, the digital photo of the object. And digital photo of the object is really just a whole bunch of bytes and bits in there. So the robot, or the computer program, or computer, or whatever you want to call, is just looking at that number. And my question is, how do we tell that person, or that robot, um, how to lead that like us humans do with these orange attributes? And another question is that, is it really like a really difficult thing to do that you have to have a PhD, or can I just use it? or can I just do it in the platform that I'm really most familiar with and the language that I'm most comfortable, which is JavaScript? And the answer is yes, you can use Canvas Element, and we'll get to that. But before we get to that, I have an announcement, not disclaimer, announcement. I consider myself as a translator. I, it's not really between two different languages, but translator in the sense of providing different perspective. I have a tendency to draw all over the technical documents. I have tendency to use a lot of analogy to explain certain concepts. So the stuff that I'm going to do today might look unfamiliar or weird, and I'm sorry if that's the case. But I really think that there is a value in having different perspective, not just only having one traditional way of describing computer science, but having a different perspective in this field. So I'm going to do that. So, image. As I mentioned, digital image is just a byte that the computer is looking at. So like, how, how can we look at that number, that ones and zeros and matrixy thing? So I made a special image. So like, if you like, straight yourself in the center, and then look left, right, down, and then go up, and then just like focus on that center for like 10 seconds, then you will look, um, start to look at this like, do you see it? Do you see the zeros and ones? No, 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 it's not like that. It doesn't work like that. You have to write a code. Um, so as I mentioned, I use a canvas element. Canvas is a HTML5 element that let you uh, write a, uh, draw a picture on your browser using JavaScript. So it's a perfect element to do this job. Create a com to create a canvas is just as easy as creating any other kind of HTML element, just create an element in canvas, or you just type it in the canvas tag and reference by ID, and you need to specify size of that. And I'd like to think this process as, for well, this stage, as like you reserved certain piece of land somewhere, but you don't know where it is yet. You need to know, because you don't know like, whether this land is in Iceland and speaks um, Iceland language, or this is in New York in the middle of like, high uh, skyscraper. So you need to give some context to this piece of land. And you exactly give the context by doing get context. You specify what kind of context you want. I'm using 2D context. But you can also specify WebGL to do the GPU programming. But at this point, you know exactly what kind of language and what kind of method that you are getting out of this context. Once you have the context, you can draw an image and do this. 
by through the context. So context uh, draw image and pass a image into it will put a digital image into canvas element. And now your JavaScript can interact, to interact with this picture. In order to get that data, whatever the computer is looking at, there is a method called get image data. And then you extract the data out of the canvas. So let's look at what's in this data element. This is what image data looks like. Just imagine you have a three by three really tiny pixel that's just like super enlarged into this uh, screen. And the left, uh, left of it is what looks like if you call get image data and then get the data out of it. It's just a J, uh, JavaScript object. Certain attributes are very obvious. Width and height is a width and height of the image with a pixel unit. And then there's data. And there's a whole bunch of numbers that you need to understand. Um, but this is ingredient, what constitute this picture. So in order to understand what this data is doing, you need to understand what's in a single pixel. So I drew the single pixel, which looks really big in here. Um, I also gave eyes to kind of like humanize it a little bit so that you like, you know, get familiar with pixel. Underneath the pixel is four values. First three, you can think of it as a different color of light bulbs, red, green, and blue. And the fourth one, we'll get to it. But you can control how bright each color of the light bulb is. So if I turn the red light bulb all the way up and turn off green and blue, then your pixel becomes red. If you do the other colors, um, you know, slightly greenish, and you can start mixing the colors in RGB space. Uh, if you have same values for each of three, you always get gray. Different shades of gray, but you always get gray. And this always get gray um, comes important later in this talk, but you can see that. Right, the fourth number is opacity. So this is purely for software to know if some images are overrated, how much should I bring it in to render it on your screen? So you can see I have slightly less opacity, and you can play around. Pretty much, you specify LGBA on your CSS. It just comes in four numbers. So, so now, um, this data start to make sense. I pad it by just a chunk of four so that it's easier to lead. And from top left corner to the bottom right corner, um, each pixel has four numbers for them. So let's do the same thing here. That uh, first pixel, because it is a first four, it should be top left corner, hopefully. Uh, let's see, let's make it into green. So I turn off all the red. Uh, red light bulb, which is the first value. And then I turn the green channel all the way up to 255, and then turn off the blue and update, and then it should turn into green. So this is how the most basic way you edit a digital image. And we will repeatedly do that for all of the pixel from now on. Now, kind of thinking this one-dimensional array data in two-dimensional space is a little hard. But what really made sense to me was when one of my mentors explained to me the way this, this way. So when you're writing a letter to somebody, in your head, you don't really think about, OK, so this paper fits 20 characters, so I'm going to think about 20 characters first. And then for next sentence, I'm going to think like another 20 character. No, your brain is thinking just a stream of data. And then when you put it onto the paper, you just unconsciously go in, up, oh, I line up the space, another line, another space, another line. So in a way, the, the what's in your head is the data that you see in the image data, and what transfer to the paper is what you're looking at on the screen as a picture. So now we know how to get to the data and how to get to the pixels and how to change the color of the pixel. Let's do something fun. I hope it translates well on the screen, but let's do something like image filter, the Instagram filter. Uh, if you research how to do the image filter, you, look at, uh, you discover the squiggly functions that's called uh, plum. I can't even pronounce. Um, <laughs> basically, mass term and then a whole bunch of maybe glass, but it's like always like gray and like 
black. I like to think of it as like introducing a social construct to this like pixel social world because it's really just setting a rule that all of the pixel follows for this picture. So like age group, who's allowed to use playground, um, certain age, you have to go to school, um, you have to start paying tax once you graduate to school, like all of those things. You just define it and then you apply it to all of the pix uh, pixels. So uh, here is a, a function that's visualized in a data visualization. In the case that you're not applying a filter, you are just like getting image in and same image out, um, it looks like this. So let's say your light bulb is illuminating, the red light bulb is illuminating 181, the output of it is always 181, and you know, it doesn't change anything. And I, I um, colored it in the gradient of red, blue, green, and blue, um, just to uh, specify that all of the three lights are going through this function. Um, so if you have a one pixel, then you do the same thing for three times for each channel. Um, all of them follow the same rule. But then, like, you know, changing the brightness, you slightly change those curves. So in this case, let's say brighten. All of the pixel, so there's a 70 to 161. Um, <coughs> so that's what, like, 73? It's like all of the pixel that goes in gets more brightened and then comes out. The contrast is similar to brightness, but it's uh, changing a slope of the curve. So here's a high contrast image, here's a low contrast image. In low contrast case, input is still from zero to 255. You haven't altered anything on the input side, but the output is limited to, in this case, 56 to 200. So it slightly lose the color that's possible. And it doesn't have to be straight line. There is this thing called posterization, and it's basically grouping the pixels together based on the number. So in this case, any pixel or any, any data that has 155 to 203 all gets 192. And this way, you get this posterized effect of color is limited. And it's kind of fun to do. So. Now that we know how to get the data, how to change the color, how about changing the structure of the picture, like blur and sharp image? Um, to do that, you need to do some kind of mask or corner convolution, which I feel like it sounds like yummy cereal, but I like to think that as like thinking about a social graph of the pixels. We introduce a social construct, but then you know within the social construct of the world, you know it has a lot of relationship in it, and you need to think about those things. So here's one pixel that we want to change the color to, change the structure of this image. Um, you, the pixel has a surrounding friend, and in case of blur, let's think about it, you want to blend it in as much as possible to your neighbors. So you lay yourself and your neighbors equally, and you get the average color, of all of the nine pixels, and then you change your color to that average color. In the bigger picture, so let's say you see here is a distinct red line going across, you do that mass for each single one of the pixel going through, and the result of that is blurred image. So this is a box blur that we just did. Uh, let's see, hover over, this is original, blurred, original, blurred. But in reality, though, like not all of your friend is like equally important, right? You have a best friend, and then you have a distant friend. So in that case, you can use something like Gaussian blur, or you can make your own um, matrix that you want to introduce. In Gaussian blur case, they use normal distribution, so your closer friend gets laid it higher, and then your distant friend, which is on the corner, gets laid it lower, and it's slightly. Um, edge-preserving way of doing the blur. And if you ever wondered why SVG filters, you have to type Gaussian blur, that's because the type of matrix that the SVG filter uses is a Gaussian filter. 
Sharp, on the other hand, is the opposite. You don't want to blend it into your friend. You want to be unique. Like you, you really want to stand out. In that case, you you laid yourself the center uh, pixel, laid yourself really high, while you don't want to get the um, inference from your friend. So like laid it zero, or you even want to like land opposite. Like if you're doing that thing, then I'm gonna go the other way. Uh, so like you uh, laid it negatively, and then that produces a um, sharped image. So here's original, sharped, it's slightly, maybe you can see it. Right, so if you want to play around all of these filters, I have a library that's called Graphy.js that let you easily um, try out those filters. Um, I kind of designed it thinking like underscore, but for image processing. So you can pass any of the image data, and then you specify the parameters, and you get an image data object out, which is the processed version of image. So if you want to play around, you can look at those. So now that we know how to get the data, how to read the data, how to change that, and then how to change a little bit of structure. Let's think about neighborhoods, because much like the city is consistent of many different neighborhoods based on whatever the attributes that we carry, um, the image has interesting parts of the image, important parts of the image, and then not interesting parts, or the differently interesting parts of the image. So how can we get that information out of this image? In order to do this, you need to do like pre-processing for like two things. One is uh, scaling and one is thresholding. And let's go through those two so that we can define neighborhood. So there is original. Let's grayscale it. As I mentioned, all of the pixel have three values. Grayscaling is the way to think that how bright each pixel is. You don't care about the color of the pixel. You are just interested in how bright are you, like what's your important, like the true self inside. Um, so how do we do that? Because we have three numbers. How, how can we do that? Well, we can take a very naive approach of just picking one. So in this case, I picked green and just use that all over, and it didn't work. The, the bottom half disappeared, because the green channel on the bottom half objects turn, uh, happens to be 0 and 0, so it just toned down. So how about like if we average it out? It's getting there. It looks like grayscale image. But here's the problem. For us, the human eyes, that green square is, looks like much brighter than the one on the blue one. But in this average grayscale image, those are two are same. If you look at numbers, it makes sense because both of them have the same amount of numbers in the pixel. Why? Because our human eyes are heavily biased towards one color, which is green. So when you look at it, even with our thinking, you feel like green is brighter. You, you feel like green is valuable. And you need to, um, this proposed interesting question of like we alter our code so that it works with our cognitive bias, which is doing a, a Luma coding. So Luma coding is the coding that you used in the TV industry. Uh, it's basically giving a privilege in each green channel while um, not really giving the privilege on blue and red channel. And then output of that looks slightly like natural, quote unquote, for us eyes. Natural, not natural in the numbers, but natural for our eyes. We got through the grayscaling. Another one is the threshold. Once you have a grayscale, you got a little three-channel thing. You are now only have information about how bright the pixel is. But you want to get down to more, uh, more uh, smaller numbers. So you, um, the grayscale is the image that contains a number from 0 to 255, uh, so 256 uh, shades of gray. Thresholding is the way to make the image into just black and white and nothing in between. So in this graph case, we have a, um, let's see, if I want to extract this light bulb corner, then I would just slightly alter this, and then here, threshold it. So anything that's below 153 gets 0. Anything above that gets 255, and you get uh, black and white photography. So once we have that and we kind of isolated the, the object that you are interested in, um, the picture ended up like this. Uh, well, 
let's just uh, imagine that picture will end up like this. So we kind of like grayscaled it and adjusted the threshold and then isolated it. So how can we tell computers how to identify what's in it? Because our human eyes, it's easily can tell there's a two white regions in this image and the, the shape of the image, like which is larger and which is smaller. But in computer's case, remember, it only knows, is it black or white? They don't have any idea about the shape. So how can we tell a computer that? So let's tell a computer that, which is called labeling. So computer goes through from the top left corner and then finds first white pixel and then says, OK, I found a white pixel. Let's label it one go through another uh, second column, and then find another one, and then ask the question, same question, it's white. Is it any way connected to uh, the pixel that I'm already identified? No. So it labels as two. This one is really interesting. Um, it's asked the same question. I found a white pixel. Is it connected to anything that I already identified? As a human eyes, it's clearly connected to other white pixels. But remember, at this point, the computer doesn't know less of it. It only knows the past. There. So it says, OK, it's not connected. I'm going to be label three. The next one, it now clearly knows that it is connected on the top and the left side. And it says, OK, I'm going to label it one, but take a note that three was also a possibility. And then do the same thing. And then come back to that memoed uh, label three that was like, you know, come back. And then re-evaluate re those pixels. And then indeed, it is connected to label one. So you get one. So now, at this point, computer knows there's two interesting place in this picture. However, what they don't know yet is where it is or where the border is. So we need to um, find the edge of each object. How do we do that? Kind of the same thing. Uh, computer finds the first white pixel again. And because it is the first one, it defines as a border. And then it um, does a slightly different thing going through the edges. So it asks, is the left side of me white? No. So move on. Is the uh, left bottom side of me white? It's white. So OK, so I move on to that and label that as a border. So do the same thing. Is it white? No. Is it white? No. Is it white? Yes. So do that. And then now computer knows where the border of the interesting part is. So at this point, our robot or computer knows, looking at this, or like give the data of this, knows, um, hmm, let's see, let's think about the question that they can answer. They can answer there are just three interesting parts in this picture. They can, uh, if I ask like, where is the yellow E part of the interesting part, they will point to the middle. Uh, if I ask like other color, it will point to the other one. But what they cannot tell is like a question like, which one is round or which one is triangular. And at this point, you can think of many ways to uh, uh, label or like find that information. You can go into machine learning and just try to train the lava to like by giving them a lot of references. Or you can go into using a lot of um, ah, keep in my mind, uh, a lot of geometry mass to try to find out the shape of the image. So for now, I'm running out of time. So let's do one quick demo of how to find a circle in this image. In order to find circle, there is a very simple mathematical function uh, that you can apply. And it's called circularity shape factor. Um, the calculation is 4 pi times area divided by circumference. It sounds like math, but we already know those information. Area, because we labeled it with one or two, right? So we already know how big each of the object is. And circumference is the edge of the object. So we labeled it. So we know the length of the circumference. So we all have a number that we can just put it into this formula and get number out. This shape factor returns one if the object is completely circle. And as the object uh, move further away from the circle, the number goes down. So if I were to try to find a circle, then you can just learn uh, this function and then just kind of set the threshold of uh, if the value comes out of this is 1 to like 0.9, then I'm going to say this is around. So 
I have a one quick demo that I made, which is to find circles. So here I have two socks. I organized a meetup in Brooklyn called BrooklynJS, and for our two-year anniversary, we made a JavaScript uh, socks. And also, I have my own socks that is slightly similar patterns. It's like you know different shapes, and then the one shape is circle, and one shape is triangle. So let's see if I put it over there. And as I explained, the you can see the original picture, grayscaled one, and how I extracted the threshold. Let's ask our robot if this is a JavaScript socks. And it says it looks like a JavaScript socks. And then let's give a triangle one and let's say if it says so or not. So, you know, same thing and then test it. And it says, no, this socks is not JS powered. <laughs> because I applied the function saying, like, is it circle or is it triangular? And, you know, you can see in the threshold the object that comes out of the threshold is certainly rounder than this one, which is clearly triangle. I have to click on it. It'll be great to um, <clears throat> kind of not do that and automatically detect. But there's a challenge in browser. See, as I mentioned, there's so many masks going on. Like, you know, even the demo that was like tiny, there's so many pixels and there's three channels of each of them. So, so many, so many, so many masks are going on that browser gets really unhappy if you're doing it in your main thread. So, I would suggest that you just um, investigate using something like WebWorker. And I like to think WebWorker is like an international space station to um, us the browser DOM that is the ARS. It is something that we launched, and it is something that we created. We communicate data over it and do any math and scientific research over there, and you get the data out. But the International Space Station does not belong in the Earth, so it doesn't have access to DOM nor access to window. So you can only communicate over data. Well, you might ask, like, how about service worker is the buzzword? Well, I like to think service worker as like UFO, which is a similar thing. It's in the space, but there is so many leg up work that browser provides, like background sync and push notifications, that um, you are not controlling. In Bob Walker's case, in the life cycle of your application, you create a worker you uh, terminate the worker, you control what the web worker is doing. Service worker, same idea, don't have access to DOM, don't have access to window, but um, it is something that you don't know how it's doing on the back. So the best part is that it's really easy to start. You start a new worker and then start launch the service station. You import scripts if you want to use outside library, because again, I mentioned you, uh, there's no access to window. So even if you might already have underscore in your application, you have to install it again in the worker side. And then in between worker and main thread, you communicate uh, by uh, using method post message and listening to the on message um, event. And then once you're done with it, you terminate and you're done. You control entire life cycle of workers. So here's an example of very image processing heavy app that I made that is not a worker, Duh, I guess. Uh, I'm doing a bunch of blur operations, and it is just completely freeze the UI and not doing anything. And once it's done and it comes back, all of the click events that was accumulated just like throw it around. So this is not really good, a good user experience. So this is a worker version, which animation doesn't get blocked. You can actually see that I'm applying a blur function again and again and again. UI works. Um, and then now it says processing, and it comes back as a processed image. So it actually works faster, too. So I encourage you to um, investigate what's possible inside of the browser. It's really easy to say, oh, like you should use C because it's bare metal and it's fast. But us, we are web developers. I, I hope you're uh, also some kind of web developers. We deal with users, and we deal with users' intentions and cheating on the users' uh, uh, users' actions. So we can create much meaningful interaction by just using what's available in browser, not even going into creating another app or anything. Browser has so many potentials. 
If you get inspired by this talk and want to investigate more, I have two recommendations. Uh, Book of Shaders, if you want to go into uh, WebGL uh, coding, um, Patricio and Jen are artists based in New York that created a book that is also illustrated and explained in a different point of view. Another one is a machine learning for artists. Um, Dean teaches a machine learning class at art school, so he has a he screen recorded entire semester worth of material and then put it onto GitHub, and you can watch it. And it's really interesting, creative use of machine learning. Um, inspired by those two, I'm thinking of turning these contents into some kind of online book. So if you're interested, maybe. Um, I cannot guarantee when it's done. Um, again, my Twitter handle is that. I have a googly eyes on my bed, so if you find me, come talk to me. And if you want to have googly eyes, I have extra ones. Um, there's a two links to my projects and reference. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>